Amen. All right, so here in Luke chapter 2, the, the famous story, we hear it all the time at Christmas time. But we're going to look at a different aspect of this. I want you to look at verse number 25. Luke chapter 2, verse number 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. So this man was saved. It says that he was just, right? He's justified from his sins. He was devout. He was dedicated to the Word of God, to obeying what it says. It says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was looking forward to all the prophecy that would be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Look what he says, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. So that God's Spirit was falling upon him. He was prophesying. He was a preacher. He was a devout man. So God used him here in this story. Look at the next verse. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost revealed to him he would see the Lord's Christ, right? The Savior of the world. Verse 27. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up in his arms and blessed God. Right? So here Simeon takes the babe, Jesus, right? Takes the Christ, holds him up in his arms. Look what he says. Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. So here he's, pro he's saying these things. He's holding him up and saying, this is salvation. This is the glory of Israel. This is what Israel was all about as he held Jesus Christ. Joseph's mother marveled at those things which were spoken. And here's a prophecy that Simeon says. Look at this. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. And then he turns to the child, he says, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. The title of my sermon this morning is The Prophecy of Simeon for Israel. Let's read this verse again in 34. He says, And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. I've got three points this morning. Jesus Christ was spoken a prophecy here of the fall of many in Israel. Jesus Christ was also spoken this prophecy here of the rising again of many in Israel. And also the third aspect here is a sign which shall be spoken against. Even to this day, the Lord Jesus Christ is that sign of the salvation, the glory of Israel, the consolation of Israel, and he is spoken against. Look at verse 35. He says, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now turn to Matthew 21. Now a lot of people, you know, the Catholics pray to Mary, and that's one of the verses they'll use. Well, see, he was telling Mary, you're going to be, a sword will go through and the hearts will be revealed to you. That's why they pray to her. The Bible, he's holding the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying a sword will pierce thee through. That's prophecy from the Old Testament, from the book of Zechariah. So Jesus is the one that knows the thoughts and intents of the hearts. We don't pray to Mary. We pray to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this verse does not justify praying to a woman, an earthly person. But notice he also said in there, as your turn, he said that he would be a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. And thank God that he is the light of the world and that he has lightened the nations, the Gentiles, because without the light of Jesus Christ, we would not be saved. And that's what this prophecy is all about. But the first part of the prophecy of Simeon's prophecy here is that Jesus would be set for the fall of many in Israel. There were things established in Israel that God said, hey, that's got to fall. 
That's got to go down because Jesus is here. There's a new covenant coming. The promise of all the prophecy, of all the consolation of everything is coming to a fruition and the old has to pass away for the new to begin. You're in Matthew chapter 21. Find verse number 12. Verse number 12, it says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Jesus comes in. This is at the end of his ministry. This is the second time that he cast people out of the synagogue, the money changers, all the, everything that was happening, these false prophets. So Jesus violently removes them. He casts them out that sold doves. Some people, oh, but he just ran the doves off. No, he ran them out that sold doves. Now Jesus is coming in and he's making a division. He had been preaching and this is where he's wrapping up his ministry. And it says that there would be, it was set for the fall of many. And he's calling them a den of thieves. You're, you're thieves. And, and he said, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, right? A house of prayer for all nations. And instead, what was it? A den of thieves. Jesus preached against it. You know, and and, you know, the religious leaders in Israel at that time, they were very corrupt. They preached a false gospel. They told people to do things they themselves would not do. Jesus called them hypocrites. He said they were, they were children of hell. He warned against them. He preached against them. He throws them out. Look at verse number 19 in this chapter. Matthew 21, verse 19. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it let no fruit grow on these on thee hence forward forever look people like to take israel and say oh that's the fig tree that's going to re-blossom hey right here jesus as an example says hey they're not going to grow forever jesus is saying i'm done with israel it's time for that structure to fall and the true israel of god or those that have set jesus christ to their testimony in their heart those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Israel of God, according to the scriptures. And here he's saying that he, he cursed the fig tree as an example of what he was saying to the nation of Israel. Look, he says, and presently the fig tree withered. Presently, immediately, the fig tree dried up. Can you imagine that power? Could you imagine the power if somebody could walk up to this little palm and say, you're cursed, and it died, and it withered, and it was dead immediately? That might get your attention. Look, Jesus did this to his examples to teach them something about the nation. They're worried about the nation. They're worried about the temple. They're worried about the ruling and reigning. And they didn't understand the things that were yet to happen. He told them many times that he would die and rise again. But yet they didn't really get that and understand it until after it all happened. Look at verse 20. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered? Look, the nation, the nation would cease to be blessed of God because they re rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They would cease from being God's people because they reject their own Savior. And you know, the nation in a sense became rejected. They became reprobate. And yes, they were the people of God. And yes, today they are reprobate. But obviously, salvation is an individual thing. There were people of the nation in the Old Testament that were not saved. There were people of other nations in the Old Testament that were saved, that our children of God will see them in heaven, will see them in the resurrection, just like Nineveh. And here he's warning, you know, hey, Israel had the oracles of God. They had the prophecy. They had the prophets. Salvation was preached unto them over and over and over, generation after generation. They were supposed to be missionaries. They were supposed to be a nation that was the light unto the Gentiles. They did not. Jesus came to do that. And he did it by us by going out to all the nations and by getting people saved. They were rejected of God. Now moving down in verse 31, we're going to look at this, we're at the parable of the two sons. Look at Matthew 21, 31. Jesus asked the question after giving this parable, he says, whether of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. He says, hey, the people that we can see their sin, they're going to heaven. And you righteous, appearing, religious leaders, you're going to hell. 
You will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Hey, in Matthew 8, he said that the children of the kingdom will be cast out. They will be in outer darkness where weeping and gnashing of teeth. He said, I don't care what your bloodline is. If you don't believe on Jesus, you're going to hell. Amen. It's a no-brainer. But yet today there are people very confused on what Israel is. And here we see in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is probably read in almost every church, every December, every year. They have kids that get up and quote it and memorize it. And here he's saying, hey, there's going, he is set. This child Jesus was set for the fall of many in Israel. But people ignore that. They're looking for Israel to come back. They're looking for that land for something to happen. They're looking for people that don't have the bloodline, that don't have the religion, and they want to call them blessed. But God cursed them. He cursed them, and immediately it withered. And we know history tells us the same thing. Shortly after Jesus, the nation was wiped out. The nation was judged, and that was of God. Look at verse 42. Matthew 21, 42. Jesus said unto them, Do ye never, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and is it marvelous in our eyes? Look, the stone that the builders rejected, that is the rock of our salvation. That is Jesus Christ. Our rock is not as their rock. Our rock is the one true living God. And Jesus says, you're going to reject me. This is God's doing that you've rejected me because Judaism had become this false religion. We're warned in the Bible specifically about the Jews' religion. Look, that's not a race Right? They're, it's talking about a religion. There's a big difference, and people don't get that. Look at verse 43. He says, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Jesus is saying, I'm going to destroy your false religion, and hey, you need to humble yourself to be saved. Now turn to Romans chapter 11. So here Jesus clearly says, I am taking it from this nation. The nation of Israel is that cursed fig tree. It's presently withered. It is cursed. He's done with it. And yet he says it will be given to another nation. And that nation is not a nation with physical boundaries. The nation is what God's God's people has always been, which is spiritual. Those that are circumcised in the heart. That's true Israel. It's not about the land. Even Abraham, he didn't look for the land. The promise was of heavenly Jerusalem. That's what we look forward to. Look, and false Judaism had to fall in Israel. The Pharisees lost their seat. They lost their authority. They were children of the devil. Jesus came and judged them. In Galatians 5, he says, Christ has become no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. They said, we do the law. We're justified by keeping the law. He says, you're fallen from grace. You don't have grace. You don't have mercy. You're not saved. In Hebrews 7, it says, the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity of change also of the law. So what happened? He took the priesthood from him. Hey, we are Christians. We believe in the priesthood of the believer. We'll be kings and priests unto him, right? So the priesthood had to be changed. The law was changed. Now, he's not talking about, well, thou shalt not kill. That law still exists, always has, from Genesis, even before it was written down in Exodus. Uh, that law has existed. What has changed is the carnal ordinances. We don't have a priesthood. They don't sanctify. They don't do the, the sacrifices. They don't do the meats and the drinks and those types of offerings. We as Christian believers, what do we have to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation has always been by faith. And he had that nation for an example. Those ordinances that are done away, the Passover, all of that was foreshadowing Christ to come. Now that Christ has come, there was a necessity of a change of the law. The priesthood had to change. That, those things had to fall. You're in Romans chapter 11. Look at verse number 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now imagine being a Gentile in this time. Imagine being somebody from a different country that you heard the gospel, you believed, 
And you can point and say, well, that's where the prophecy came. That's where the Messiah came. It was to that nation and those tribes. And even, yea, that religion, the Jews' religion. And he says, they have not obtained it because they're trying to work their way to heaven. You who have believed, you are the election because you've made your selection the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. They rejected Jesus as their Savior. They're no longer Israel. They were never really Israel in their heart. They weren't circumcised in the heart. But that physical nation was a foreshadowing. It was an image of things to come. The believers have obtained it. And it says the rest were blinded. They're spiritually blind. Look at verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. You understand, a lot of your dispensationalists, they just loved, oh, well, David was saved different and David had to do this to be saved. The David was saved by faith alone, just as we are. And David, if you know the story about Ziklag, when he got back, there were sons of Belial there that were talking about how they're going to divide everything. David had sons of the devil fighting against him throughout the whole history of his kingdom. And David cursed Israel, the sons of the devil, because he was a son of God. David, he's saying, let that be a stumbling block. He's saying, let faith alone on the Son of God, that sacrifice to come, let it be a stumbling block to those sons of the devil. Let them fall over that. Let them trip. Let them go away. He says, and recompense unto them. Let them be paid for their evil heart. Look at, well, say right there. In 1 Corinthians 1, he says, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. You go out into the world, but, oh, that's silly. You believe some book that some guy, some God. Can't. Yes, I do. That's the promise. Look, our sin deserves hell. That is the punishment for our sin. There is only one way out. Our soul and our spirit last forever. God made it very easy. And what do you have to do? Humble yourself as a little child. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe the testimony, the record of his son, that he is God, that he's your savior. He's the only way. And that's what most people won't do. It is foolishness to the Greeks, to a lot of the nations. It is a stumbling block to the Jews because they say, well, we didn't like him. We're waiting on another Savior. Hey, there's only one Savior and you reject him. Then that's your fate. You've sealed your fate. Look at verse 10. David praying here, he says, let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back all the way. David is cursing them in a prayer here. In verse 11, he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. What's he saying here? They fell. He said, should they fall? God forbid. But yet they did fall. What happened? Israel, the nation, was divided by those that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and those that did not. Look, those that reject him, that's their fall. They're done. Those that have believed the promise, they've received the blessing. The others are cursed. Those that were falling at that stumbling block of Jesus Christ, they are cursed. You know, in Revelation it says that in the end times, when he, he brings everybody, we're going to see all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues. It's not just the 12 tribes. We will see those real 12 tribes. We will see that at the resurrection. And there will be people from all nations, even the nations that don't exist today. All peoples, all kindreds, all tongues. There are languages that have ceased to exist today, but there are people from those languages that are saved. There are nations today that we would say, well, that nation's cursed. Oh, look at Iran, look at North Korea, look at China. All nations, all kindreds, all tongues. There are believers on the Lord Jesus Christ in those nations today. And they will be with us at the resurrection. And he says here that the fall... Well, so they would see the Gentiles saved, the miracles working through Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. They would see the prophecy coming to life and being fulfilled, and they knew the prophecy, and they're like, but they're not Israelites. How are they getting blessed? Why are they preaching? Why is the miracle happening to them? They're not even of our tribe. Hey, they don't keep our law. They don't keep our sacrifice. Jesus wanted to provoke them to jealousy. And even today, they're, they're, it's really like they're more envious than jealous. They hate the Lord Jesus Christ. They hate Christianity, and they want to attack it and destroy it. Look at verse 12. Now, if the fall of them 
be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. He's saying, hey, the fall of them, the fact that Jesus said that when that prophecy of Simeon, that this child is set for the fall of many in Israel, yeah, they fell away. And that is the riches of the world. The gospel has gone through the entire world. It's a beautiful thing. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. But he goes on, he says, how much more their fullness? What does that mean? There were Israelites that were raised in the Jewish religion that read the prophecy, that looked for the Christ, and they believed. And they were saved. That's the fullness. That's the fulfillment of the prophecy. Jesus fulfilled those things, and now there's no need of that priesthood. Now there's no need of that temple. Oh, well, they're going to build that temple one day and we'll know that the Bible's true. No, 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 no. That temple's a false temple. It's, it's of the Freemasons. It's not really Solomon's. It's not really God's. It's not really the Holy of Holies. It's a lie. It will be a deception that will be used to try to trick people, mostly Christians. There will be a falling away and people will bow down and send money and lambs and all these other things for the sacrifice and they will ignore the clear scripture about the Lord Jesus Christ. That He is our Passover. He has fulfilled those things. He is our temple. He dwells with men in our heart. He doesn't need a Holy of Holies. He doesn't need an Ark of the Covenant. He doesn't need those things. Those were a picture of things to come, and it has been fulfilled. So Simeon, Simeon prophesied of that. This is the fall of Israel. This babe, this child will be the fall of Israel, he's saying. Can you imagine hearing that? Can you imagine being the mama and hearing that? Your baby is going to destroy this nation. Whoa, I thought you said he was the Savior. I thought he was the glory of Israel. He is. But the glory is spiritual. It's not physical. Look, you're in 1 Peter chapter 2. Find verse number 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. All right, so first, first Peter chapter 2, 5 here, he's saying, we are a spiritual house. We are, he says, lively stones. We are built stone upon stone. We are in the house, right? We're built together. And he's saying that we are the priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices, not physical, not blood, not animals, a spiritual sacrifice, your prayer, your song, you're preaching, sacrificing the, in the flesh, dying to yourself so you can live for Him. He says, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. There's no sacrifice acceptable to God without Jesus Christ. If they build a temple, it doesn't matter. It's not by Jesus Christ. God won't accept that. God won't be pleased with that. John Hagee might be happy. God will be upset. God will say, that's a lie. That's of the devil. Look at the next verse, verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture... Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Romans 10, if you believe it, we will not be ashamed. Hey, thank God that we believe, we understand these things. It is simple. Obviously, it's mysterious, but it takes some faith. And that's what they lack. Look at verse 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, right? Romans 10 also warns about disobeying the gospel, right? He says, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And the stone of stumbling, look at this in verse 8, the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them that stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Those that rejected the Word of God, the Scriptures of God, they also stumbled at the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that have a problem with the Bible, they're going to have a problem with the Lord's Christ, which is Jesus. He's the only Savior of the world. If you don't believe the Bible, you can't be saved because you're not going to believe Jesus. You're not going to believe the record. Look at verse 9. But ye, now who's the ye here? Us. Go back to verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe. That's us. Verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light. Who is that nation that he took it away from and gave it to? 
We are the nation that he gave it to, and yet we are of many kindreds and tongues and peoples. Thank God that he's been merciful to us. Look at verse 10. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Man, thank God for his mercy. Go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. So we are now the people of God. Amen. You're God's people. You are God's chosen people. You are God's holy nation. You are God's royal priesthood. You're a chosen generation. You're not a generation of vipers like the Jews are. You're a chosen generation because you have chose the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Amen. Anybody that rejects him will be rejected of him. You're in Acts chapter 4. Find verse number 8. Again, circumcised in the heart, right? A house of prayer for all nations. That's us. Look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done unto the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, look at verse 10, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised up from the dead, even by him does this man stand before you whole. What's he doing? He's preaching the gospel. You killed your Christ. You killed the Savior. You've rejected him. I want you to know that's how this miracle happened. Can you imagine that? No, no, we're going to put him to death. We've got to stop these miracles. Oh, no, what if all the people believe? We've got to put him to death. Well, then he dies, he comes back. There's thousands of people that I witness, more miracles. And then here come his disciples, those that they've rejected, right? And what are they doing? The same miracles by the same power of God, by the same Holy Spirit that now indwells them and preaches through them. With boldness, he's against the, the leaders of Israel. Can you imagine? I mean, imagine the power that Jesus was just put to death. Can you imagine if they came and killed Pastor Mero and then you start preaching, killed me? And then you stand up in that same power and Holy Spirit and you go to those same people and say, you put him to death. God is in charge. You're of the devil. Can you imagine that? You see how powerful the, his disciples, the testimony from those that were with him. Yeah. Look what it says in verse 11. He goes back to this same thing. He says, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Look, Israel had to fall for the riches of the world. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Praise the Lord for that. Look, now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned, ignorant men. They marveled and took knowledge of them, for they had been with Jesus. Well, if they're unlearned and ignorant, where'd they get this power? From Jesus. Well, how come they're not doing it? All? Hey, the power of the Holy Spirit was speaking through them. Go back to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, where we started. So he said, Many in Israel shall fall for rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So the second point about Simeon's prophecy is the rising again of many in Israel. This is the positive side, right? And look at chapter 2, look at verse 34. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall of and rising again of many in Israel for a sign which shall be spoken against. Look, we will be victorious over death by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This body will pass away. There's nothing you can do to stop it. When it's your time, you're done. Be at peace. Thank the Lord. Your soul is what matters. Your soul and your spirit will last forever. And the blessing comes from having faith. Look back at verse number 30. Victory only comes through Jesus. Look at Luke 2, verse 30. It says, well, this is what Simeon's saying in his prophecy, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He's saying to God, this is your salvation. That's where it started. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. Was this hidden under a bushel? No. Were there people that didn't know? Look, Jesus Christ has been preached all around the globe and back and again for many generations. This isn't, oh, well, there, there's that tribe in Africa. Hey, that tribe in Africa probably has a church an hour away. Look, the gospel has been preached and preached and preached. It, still, it comes to us, though. We, we shouldn't just, well, sit, well, there's churches. 
on every corner. We don't have to worry about anything. No, we do. Look, we need to worry about Jacksonville, Florida. We need to preach the gospel in Jacksonville, Florida. How many of you can say for sure that there are at least 10 good soul winning churches in Jacksonville? Anybody? Is there one? There's one. There's one. Hey, now there's two. Maybe, there, maybe one day there'll be three. Look, God's trying to do something here. He's trying to wake people up. There's a church out, out yonder, Emmanuel. They've knocked on my door. All, all the time I lived in Fort Worth, I never had anybody knock on my door that was saved. The other times I've lived in Florida, I've never had somebody knock on my door that was saved. It's happened here. It has happened here in Jacksonville, Florida. Their gospel was right. I couldn't talk them out of it. And the, the, it was two ladies. They were trying to get our kids to go on the bus. And I, uh, so, I, okay, well, let me, <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, right? So I'm asking them trick questions. I'm going to see if I can talk them out of it. Let's see what kind of Baptist they really are, right? Hey, they're King James. They're independent. They're, they say faith alone, and it seems that they're on track with that, right? And, I, and so I'm asking them difficult questions, and these poor ladies are scrambling, and, uh, well, all I know is the Bible teaches once saved, always saved. And I, hey, that's right. You know, that's not a quote, but that is doctrine that's in the Bible. That is the gospel. I said, well, praise the Lord. There is somebody here. But maybe, you know, they're more worried about getting my kids on the bus. Good thing they preach the gospel right on their website. Good thing they're knocking on doors. I know, Brother Marcel, you've ran into the same church over at your house. Hey, they're out doing some work. But hey, that doesn't mean we're just going to say, hey, well, we don't need to have a soul winning program then. They've got a bus. What are we doing knocking doors? Now look, <laughs> Jesus is set for the rise of many. There will be a resurrection one day. In those that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will live forever. From the day they believe it, moving forward, they will never perish. It's our job to go out and preach that. Look what he says in verse 32. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. That's our job to lighten the Gentiles. We are here to lighten the Jacksonville, Jacksonvilleans, right? The west side, the east side, the beach side, the north side. We'll go to Georgia. We're going down to Orlando. We're going to hit everything we can in this area, and we're going to keep doing it and keep doing it. That's the only reason God would let us bless this church. This church is built on soul winning and discipleship, and that's, how, that's what we're going to do as long as God gives us this, this church. As long as we have a group coming together, we're going to go out and get people saved, and we're going to teach the Bible from here. That's what it's all about. That's what every other church is missing. They've got the fun in the games, and, and they have forgotten why Jesus came. Look, it's not for fun songs. I like the fun songs. Those, those cool B-I-B-L-E. The kids love singing that. That's good. But they never open it. They sing B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Do they bring a Bible? No. Do the kids have a Bible? No. Do they use the Bible? No. We're going to do a flannel graph. We're going to show you a cartoon now. We're going to put on some veggie tales. Why don't they keep, teach the kids the Bible? It's our job to disciple our own. And that's what we're going to do. That's how Jesus is the light to the Gentiles. That's how we are going to be a light unto Jacksonville is to teach the Word of God. Look at verse 33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken to them, right? Whoa, the glory of Israel rejected of many. What's he saying? Look at 34 again. And Simeon blessed them. This prophecy is a blessing. And said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Go to John chapter 11. We're going to talk about this, the rising again of many in Israel. In John chapter 6, it says this, you're going to John 11, in John 6 it says, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should rise it up again at the last day. Why did Jesus come? To rise us up again at the last day. So here in John chapter 11, Jesus is going, he's told that Lazarus is dead. He meets them on the look at verse 22 here, he says, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Hey, she had better doctrine than some of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. She understood the scriptures. She looked forward to this prophecy. She anticipated the consolation of Israel. I know he's going to come back at the last day. I just miss him now. Lord, if only you'd been here, you could have revived. You know, that's what she said. Look what, look what he says, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. We were all spiritually dead before we were saved, and yet we shall live from the time that we get saved forever and ever and ever. Look at verse 26. And whosoever, that's anybody, liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? That's a good question to ask somebody at the door. Look what he says here. If you live and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never die. Do you believe this? Believest thou this? Do you believe the gospel? Do you understand what's being preached here? Verse 27, she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. She believed. She was saved. And we know Lazarus came back. Go to Luke chapter 11. Go, go to Luke chapter 11. Because she believed that he was the Christ, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, she will rise again in the resurrection. She knew Lazarus would rise again in the resurrection. But yet, Lazarus died. Jesus rose him again. Which, by the way, Jesus only resurrected saved people. He didn't just go, oh, anybody can... No, no, no. Jesus, I believe he only resurrected saved people and of course they died again Lazarus is dead again his body has it's in the grave but yet Lazarus himself is in heaven and he will yet rise again in the last day just as she said in Romans 15 he says and again Isaiah saith there shall be a root of Jesse and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him shall the Gentiles seek in, Genesis, in, in, in Romans 15, he's saying that Jesus will come, this root of Jesse, and he will rise to reign over all the nations, and all the nations will put their trust in him. All the nations that rise with him, they would have put their trust in him. And since you have, you have a promised resurrection. This is part of the gospel. The fall of physical Israel had to happen to build this spiritual Israel. And we will revive with him. We will re rise again, as he said. And the third part of Simeon's prophecy is that Jesus would be a sign that shall be spoken against. It happened in his time, and it happens in our time. In Matthew 24, it says, They shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Jesus preaching to his disciples said, they're going to hate you because of me, right? They've kept my words, they'll keep your words. They hate your master, they're going to hate you, the servant, right? He is a sign that will be spoken against for all time, obviously, until he returns. In Luke chapter 11, where you're at, look at verse number 29. Luke 11, 29. And when the people were gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Now we did a Bible study in the book of Jonah, and what happened? Jonah was a foreshadowing of what happened with Christ. Jonah went into the belly's well, and Jonah said, I'm crying out of hell. Right? Acts 2.31, he's seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Jesus is saying, you know what happened to Jonah? You've read the prophecy of Jonah. You've read the scriptures. That's what's going to happen to me. I'm going to go into the grave. I'm going to come back in three days. This is the sign that everybody will see. Because it wasn't just the sign of dying. Everybody dies. It was the sign of him being the first fruits of the resurrection. Again, and all this was foretold, but they didn't get it all. You know, they saw it th sort of mysterious. They understood there would be a final resurrection, but yet she's talking to the Savior. She's saying, well, I know there'll be a resurrection at the last day, but obviously it's not the last day if you're here. That's why a lot of them were confused, looking for that reigning, the ruling and reigning of the kingdom. But we see in, in Romans chapter 15, he's quoting back to Isaiah, saying Isaiah said that he would rise to reign. So Jesus had to die. He had to rise again. He's ascended into heaven. He will come back and resurrect everyone that is saved. That's the sign that he was warning about. And look at verse 31. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment. The, by, by the way, the queen of the south is not of any of the 12 tribes of Israel. By the way, the queen of the south did not have, she was not part of the Jewish religion. But you know what? She was one of God's chosen people because she chose God. She believed the gospel. Her heart was circumcised. She was saved in the Old Testament. She 
will rise in the resurrection. It says, she shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being one of these high, holy, long robe wearing Pharisees? I tithe of all that I have. I fast twice in the week. Oh, look at me. I'm, I'm holier than thou. I've, I can count my lineage and I'm of the priesthood and I studied under Dr. Rabbi so-and-so. And Jesus looks at them and says, you're going to be judged by a woman that wasn't even of the 12 tribes. She is saved. She will rise again and live forever. You will be condemned to hell. Can you imagine the power of what he's saying there? They knew the history. They knew who he was talking about. And he's condemning them because of their lack of faith. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Turn to Acts chapter 28 and we'll be done. He's saying, hey, the men, the men in Nineveh, they repented. It says in verse number 5, Jonah 3, 5, they believed God. They got saved when Jonah preached. When, when, when Solomon preached his wisdom, he didn't just say, here's how you run a kingdom. He says, here's how you run your life. Here's how you get saved. This is where my wisdom comes from. It's from God. It's from his word. I imagine Solomon sent her on her way with a Bible, whatever he had of a Bible. You think about it. God, Solomon gave her true wisdom, which only comes from God. We're learning in Proverbs. The men of Nineveh will rise in judgment because they were saved, and they will condemn the Pharisees, those that fell in Israel because they re rejected Jesus. In Revelation 13, he says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Right? Lucifer's cast out of heaven. And then the Antichrist is propped up. Men begin to worship him. He blasphemes God in heaven, the saints in heaven, the tabernacle in heaven. Right? That's the sign that's spoken against. Even that end times antichrist, what's he going to speak against? Jesus Christ. He's going to blaspheme. He says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This antichrist will rule in the end times, but he will not succeed. He will be a little bit successful for a little bit of time for 42 months. And then comes the judgment. Then comes the rising again. And he, in the meantime, he's going to speak against that sign. He's going to attack those that believe that sign of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in Acts chapter 28. Look at verse 22. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. All right, sect means section, right? Sect means Oh, these group of, well, they're not Jews. What do they call them? They end up giving them a name called Christians. Well, these believers in Jesus, these disciples of Jesus, he says, everywhere it is spoken against. Can you imagine having that reputation? Because there are people, I mean, imagine somebody in Jacksonville, you're with Steadfast? Man, I saw you guys on the news. I saw you on the Southern Poverty Law Center hate list. I, why are you so spoken against? Would you talk, tell me about it? What's going on? And then out of love, you compel them and show them the scriptures. Can you imagine? Oh, they're wicked. They're evil. Oh, that's just, just a hate group. And Why are you so spoken against? Because Jesus was spoken against. Jesus was hated and put to death by the Antichrist nation of Israel. And he made that nation fall. He crumbled it. It's put into powder. And guess what? Now he's given us the promise. It is the riches of the world. We have the blessing. We will rise again. And yet that sign is still spoken against today. And yet you as believers are spoken against today. That's okay. Settle it in your heart. Don't worry about it. Hey, that's a good thing. When you take, when you suffer for Christ's sake, you have riches in heaven. God will bless you greatly for just taking it. Just put up with it. Look at the next verse, last verse. Acts 28, 23. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many unto him in his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and the prophets from morning to evening. 
Oh, well, I heard your church is just a hate group because you don't let the pedophiles in your church. Why are you, why, what, people are going to be interested. Why are you taking a stand? Why do you believe the Bible? Well, let me compel you out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets and out of the gospels that Jesus is Christ. He's the Lord. And the nation of Israel that's rejected him, they are rejected of God. Look, there are some that have believed. Look, some of you may have Jewish lineage and not even know it. Maybe well, if you go back umpteen years, you know, you have some Jewish lineage and your parents or great, 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 great granddaddy was Jewish and then they got saved. They became a Christian. Now they have the blessing. You're not a Jew anymore. You're a Christian. Who is a Jew but one that is circumcised in the heart? Deuteronomy was clear. Hey, it's circumcision in the heart. It's not about the flesh. We have no confidence in our flesh. My body can't get me into heaven. My granddaddy can't get me into heaven. Only my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Simeon gave this awesome prophecy. They persuaded them concerning Jesus out of the word of God. That's what we should do when people talk about, oh, this reputation. Don't worry about that. Look, what did he say? What was Simeon's prophecy? He blessed them. He said, behold, this child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Without him, we would not be saved. And Israel had to fall. But that's the riches of the world. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for sending your son to die for our sins. Lord, thank you for this awesome, very simple prophecy that foretells the, the falling away of the old and the beginning of a new covenant. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to hear the gospel and to believe on you. And I just pray that you would help us to realize the value of it. The riches of the world is preaching the gospel. Lord, help us as we go out and preach today. And Lord, help us to be a blessing to others. Lord, I pray that you would keep us safe and just bless everybody in this church. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.